My name is David Andre Robowski. I went to college in Florida, in Tallahassee, Florida, and became a pharmacist, which I practiced for about four and a half years. My popsicle stick adventure, which I call riff stick, because in music you have musical riffs, which are a small collection of notes that are put into a sequence and then played over and over and over again to create a melody. And basically that's what I do. I take a small collection of sticks, create a pattern, and then repeat that pattern over and over and over again to create my pieces of furniture. I was born in a small city outside of St. Louis, Missouri called Dayton in 1954. I'm five years older than my youngest brother. So basically I assumed a lot of the chores around the house, uh, cooked, I cleaned, I changed diapers. This is free pampers, mind you. So that was the dipping into the commode and, <laughs> and all of that. I did my sister's hair. I should have known at that time that I was different. I would decide that I was going to paint one wall in my room. I remember painting one wall purple and then on the other side of the, of the room taking a wash towel and dipping it in like orange fluorescent paint and hurling it across the room onto the wall. And it's just so exciting. I took the legs off my bed and, and built a sandbox onto the side of it. I painted a horse on the side of the other wall. I painted uh, psychedelic circles on the other wall. I uh, got into tie dyeing and macrame. That, but the creative part was the, the most exciting for me. The city has a lot of history because it's located on the Mississippi. Race relationships were estranged during those times. Uh, not, as, not as bad as in the South, not as bad as you know down in Mississippi and, and Alabama and places like that. But still, it's friction there. At that time, what I remember is most of uh, black people that I knew were maids or elevator operators or drivers, you know, if they were lucky. They, they seemed to be the more successful of the blacks in, the, in that city at that time. But we lived in an area that quickly went from what we thought was moving on up to crime all around us. When the sun went down, you stayed your butt in the house because it was risky business going outside the house, even to go to the corner store or to the gas station or anything like that, unless you were driving. Impoverished people deal with this. It's the same, it's the same fight, it's the same fear, it's the same concern. You know? And it's very hard to, um, to get out of. I was very lucky to get out. It wasn't any of my doings. It was uh, a fluke, actually. There were two twins, the Bossman twins, who went away to college. They were musicians. The dad was a musician. And they came back and they said, wow, you should come down to Florida A&M. That's Florida Agricultural and Mechanical. And so I thought, Florida, you know, I want to get out of this place. I want to get out of St. Louis anyway. So Florida sounded really, really, you know, tempting. During that time, because it was a democratic reign and because they were trying to help underprivileged black children, and probably not just black children, all you had to do basically was to fill out the application and, and go. So I filled out an application for college in August or September. Got into the college with a low grade average and got a scholarship also. My, my major was music because I had played in the high school band. I had played clarinet and oboe and piccolo and flute. And off I went to Florida a &M. I had two roommates. One roommate, Isaiah, was a uh, pharmacy major. And the other roommate, uh, Scott, was a pre-dent major.
We all took the same courses in the beginning, and I remember not being able to understand, you know, the algebra and the, and the science and really struggled with it. Isaiah would take time to explain things to me. But Scott said to me one time, and he must have been just tired or something like that, he said, well, you go to the same classes that I go to. I get it, why can't you? And I thought to myself, wait a minute, you're not any smarter than me. You know, I don't know, you know, I just don't have the background that you have. So for the next semester, I lived with books. I took books to the bathroom. I took books to bed. I would fall asleep reading books. I would just read, read, read until I could, you know, understand what it was that I was reading. And I actually pulled a 4.0. The next semester, that physics was the way for me to learn math, to learn algebra. I couldn't remember the equations. My mind, my memory doesn't work like that. But I could see friction. I could see a slope. All I needed to know is what ends you wanted me to get to, and then visualize it, and then I could come up with my own equation to solve that problem. College became pretty, pretty, uh, pretty okay for me. The, the things that, that I would have great concern about are the things that had, have had the biggest rewards, the biggest growth steps, and have been pivotal points in my life. If Scott had not said what he said to me, I don't know that I would have been motivated to prove to him that I could, could, could do the work. You know, so, you know, I have to say thank you to him for that. instigated and inspired by my neighbor Doris Mentor. She was a teacher, and I remember being home and, and sick from school, and she brought me over a couple of boxes of popsicle sticks and some glue and said, well, you know, you're home, so maybe you can make something out of this. And I was like very excited, thinking like, well, what can I make, what can I make? And I ended up making this lamp, and I used marbles on the lamp, and then I made this little shade, and I used prisms on the shade. And everybody thought it was like great. And I don't know how I ended up, but I ended up on the local television station. I was very nervous, and I was sitting there, and the guy was interviewing me, and uh, he asked how much I would charge for these, and I remember feeling like I didn't know, but I didn't, I had to come up with something. So I said, $15 for the lamp. And so then he gave, either gave out my number or put my number on the screen. And I actually, you know, got some orders. And I think I made, you know, three or four of them and sold them for $15 a piece. Then I totally forgot about them. 40 years later or so, I'm downtown with my friend Jody. And Jody is like, well, have you ever been in this store called Muscatel's? And I'm like, no, I went in. The first thing that I saw at the end of the aisle were these boxes of popsicle sticks. And they triggered that memory of making that popsicle stick lamp when I was nine. When I told him the story, I expected, I guess, him to go like, wow, that's cool, or that's interesting, or really, or something like that. But in turn, he said, oh, that's nice. Look at this over here. And I, I was like, my feelings got hurt, right? <laughs> So I looked at the popsicle sticks and they were like, I don't know, five dollars a thousand. And I thought, well, you know, I should have one of those those lamps. I, I you know, I, I, I should have one. I, I created that lamp, I should have one. So I bought the sticks and I bought the glue. And over the next few days I sat down and started to recreate the lamp that I remembered when I was nine. But that's not the lamp that came out of me. This more elaborate lamp came out of me and I really got into it and I was like tweaking it this way and tweaking it that way and adding, you know, wooden balls and sculpturing the shade and doing all that kind of stuff, right? So when I finished with the lamp, I thought, wow, this is great. I could probably sell this lamp. The decorators are going to say, nice lamp, but don't you have a pair? <laughs> so I painstakingly recreated the same lamp 
French shop on, on Melrose. And, uh, his shop was a very refined shop, you know, full of antiquities and interesting little curiosities and things like that. So my lamps were kind of crafty looking, you know, because they were made out of popsicle sticks and, and they, you know, I didn't stain them or put varnish on them at that time. And so I was looking around the shop to see what they would look nice on. And then I thought, I should make a console table. So I was off and running making the console table. And I sat and worked on that console table for hours and hours and hours. I didn't go out of the house except for to go to the post office. You know, I, I, I basically lived at my work table until this, you know, figuring this whole thing out because I had the idea in my head, I had the picture in my head. And when I finished it, I showed that to him also. And I said, you know, can I do one of your windows and just nothing but popsicle sticks? And he said, sure, because I think the table was what won him over. The lamps were kind of iffy, but on the table, the lamps looked great. So my intent was to make a mirror and a chandelier. I did not make the chandelier, although I'm working on the chandelier now. I did not make the chandelier, but I did make the mirror and I did that popsicle stick window and it was a big success. At my first exhibit, I thought it would be kind of cool to have people sign popsicle sticks as like my guest book. The first exhibit, I got about 600 sticks. The next exhibit, which was at the Bergamon Station in Santa Monica, I got 2,500 sticks. So now we're talking, now I've got some sticks. So I was trying to figure out what to do with the sticks. So some people signed it on the right side, some people did it on the left side, some people did it back in front, some people did it in the center. So I got really frustrated and I decided to take a nap. And I remember I laid down and my mind was still racing. What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And I fell asleep. But when I woke up, I had designed a chandelier. I saw a yard sale and I stopped off at the yard sale and there was really nothing there for me that I wanted to buy. But the woman was very aggressive and she said, you want to buy some chopsticks? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, are they ivory or, or are they lacquer or are they jade? And she says, no, they're just wood. But I have a lot of them. And she says, I'll give you a really, really good deal. So I looked and here are these huge boxes of chopsticks, never been used, just packaged. I, I guess she and her husband had a restaurant at, at one time. And she says, you can have both boxes for $10. I mean, it's pieces. I thought, well, I'll work with that too, you know? So I bought the two boxes, and the, it's the chopsticks that I attach the pop, the signed popsicle sticks to. So for every prism that hangs, there are four signatures. And then I grouped all the signatures together based upon whether they signed just a first name, or whether they signed a first and a last name, or whether they declared their love for another individual, or whether it was good wishes, or whether it was a funny comment, or whether they did artwork, or whether they signed both the back and front. And I cataloged all of this. It was like having 3,000 artists help me with this project, which makes this chandelier the most unique piece that I have. And I also came to the conclusion that I could sell all of my other pieces, but I would never sell the chandelier. I see it in my head like a snapshot. And as I'm working on my pieces, I go back and forth from the snapshot to the table. And then sometimes additional inspiration will come in, or sometimes I'll be working on a piece, and because I didn't draw it out, I'll run into a wall, and then I'll have to change the snapshot. <laughs> but I change the snapshot in my head. One of the things that excites me about what I do is that I don't cut my sticks to conform to any shape. I figure out how to use the particular stick that I have to create the look that I want.
I have a seven foot Christmas tree that I made. The stalk of it is in the corner of my living room, but all the branches have been taken off, wrapped up, and packaged so that I could store them, complete with ornaments. How many decisions do I make on the placement of each stick? And it's basically, I make the decision of the stick in reference to the stick beneath it, the stick to the left, the stick to the right, and then also the stick that is going to be on top of it on both sides. So that's one, two, three, four, five decisions that I make every time I glue a stick. Now my table has 24,000 sticks, which means that I make five times that amount in, in just quick decisions, and as so far as the placement is concerned. This process of gluing the popsicle sticks is when I realized that, first of all, I'm obsessive compulsive. I was born obsessive compulsive. My mother was obsessive compulsive. As you come to terms with that, you know, I had to go on the internet and read about this and try to understand, you know, what it is exactly that's going on and things like that, I began to think about it. And I, I began to think, first of all, any great person that's made any great contribution to humanity, and I don't care what area that's in, more than likely had obsessive compulsive behavior because it takes that type of focus, that type of intricacy to be the best heart surgeon, send a rocket to the moon, to build the, the best monument or building the greatest photographer or painter. So I, I began to think and then I began to, to feel uh, among you know a nice group of people here. Um, and then I thought, but obsessive compulsive has such a negative connotation to it. And then I thought, well, we have to divide that up. We have to divide that into uh, productive obsessive compulsiveness and destructive obsessive compulsiveness. You know, because it's the same wiring, but it's what you're able to do with that wiring. Because some of us obsessive compulsive people have a very difficult time in staying focused on that or we or we end up being focused on things that don't serve us very well so i understand that but they're still my kindred they're still they're still cousins of mine it's so interesting because uh israeli salad which requires a bunch of chopping of, of vegetables in very small um, uh, little little cubes I can't tell you how that works for me, therapy-wise. I cannot tell you. I would chop, 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 chop. They had to be the same size, da 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 da, -da or close, I mean, not so far, but close to the same size, and didn't mind doing it at all. Loved it. It's therapy. What it does is it, it takes me down a notch, or two, or three, is meditation, because I think that that's the state that I if not am in, or certainly, you know, on the borders of, because I, I call it zoning. I zone out when I'm doing these things, when I'm gluing those popsicle sticks. And what's really, really interesting is every now and then, I'll find myself counting. And I'll thought, oh, you're counting. <laughs> because certain obsessive compulsive people will count things. And so I have a little bit of that in me also. There is this ex extreme and there is that extreme and there's every little combination that you could think of in the middle. And most of us are these combinations in the middle and then a few of us are the extremes. We're all wired differently, but in the infinite diverse, there is sameness. And that's my quote.